is I'm uh, going to talk about loop spaces. So this is a, I would describe it as a somewhat quixotic effort on my part, unfortunately already over several years, um, to try to uh, give a proper analytic definition of the Dirac Ramond operator. Um, so this is a Dirac, I mean, in a way my original motivation was to try and do uh, something in infinite dimensions. This is the most obvious operator in infinite dimensions, which should behave well. I mean, one knows it should behave well because all sorts of <laughs> results have been proven by guessing, I mean, by pretending it exists um, and doing uh, rigorous mathematics, but, but not actually about the Dirac Ramon operator. So I got, I'll spend most of my time uh, trying to describe the background for the Dirac Ramon operator. Um, and then maybe um, you'll get to the point. So unfortunately, the, the um, results are not complete. I still do, I mean, as you'll see, I, the Dirac Ramon operator is defined, but at the moment, um, the definition is uh, weak. Now, I mean that both as it, were, as it were in the moral sense and in the technical sense. So the, 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 it is not as yet defined on a domain uh, with a range, it's defined weakly. Uh, it is densely defined. And so it's almost certainly the case that the null space of the operator that I have at the moment is um, what you would, uh, is sort of independent of the choices because it's somehow smooth. But um, uh, there's still work to be done and I sort of hope to get other people interested. But unfortunately, there's a bit of heavy lifting at the beginning. So let me try and go through that. And then um, maybe I'll have time to, to describe my uh, embarrassment as it were in not being able to uh, solve all the problems. So first of all, uh, let's just look at the um, spin uh, Dirac operator of a Tia uh, and Stinger. So this, there's a form of the definition. In a way, I should have taken the definition even more um, abstractly than this, namely, uh, the one um, defining the operator actually over the um, principal bundle uh, and then using equivariance to define the operator on the base. That's, uh, that's somehow what one does when one writes down the formula where you take an arbitrary orthonormal basis and differentiate the spin along. But let me just quickly go through um, the ingredients of the standard spin operator because what I'm supposed to be doing is indeed a generalization of the spin operator. Um, and so, uh, of course, we presume we all know about this. Um, we have a Riemannian manifold oriented. I'll take it even dimensional. In fact, at some point, I, without worrying, I'll take the dimension to be at least a big, to be bigger than four, probably, although four is not that bad. It's just one has to say extra things. Okay, so um, the, the um, first thing is that one needs a spin structure on the manifold. Of course, one doesn't need a spin structure to define Dirac operators. But, um, and I'll just stick to the spin case, even though the general case probably, uh, one can generalize this, but I mean, since I can't do the spin case, there's not much point. Um, recent work, for example, by our, um, uh, by, by our um, organizer, uh, Fei Han, uh, maybe suggests that one can do spin C as well and so forth. Okay, so the ingredients are um, spin uh, structure, spin representation, uh, which leads to the spinner bundle. You have the levy chivita connection on the spinner bundle, uh, and you have a Clifford action on the spinner bundle S. And combining those, um, you get the uh, Dirac property. And so, of course, the, the, the big theorem about this, uh, well, not the theorem, but the impressive result was that it proved, it explained the integrality of the A hat genus of a spin manifold, which was known before, um, but was known by, um, whoops, that was bad. Um, okay. You can see my incompetence. Um, it was known, uh, the integrality was known before, um, but it, it was explained by saying it's the index of an operator in a nice way. And so this situation is relatively similar to the Dirac Ramond operator. Um, namely, the operator itself was introduced formally uh, by Ramond, as you can guess, 
on the loop space of a string manifold. So th this is obtained, I won't go through the sort of Lagrangian theory, but it's obtained um, as the Hamiltonian, you know, from a Lagrangian theory um, on the loop space, formally, of course. Um, and so we want, I want to show you what this operator is. Um, it's still, as I say, not quite uh, clear, but the uh, how far one can go, but certainly it's already been used by Witten and many others um, to write down formulas. So what Witten did he was the first one really to write down a formal localization theorem. So really about the constant loops in the space uh, and extract a, a, um, a putative index formula. So of course it wasn't the index of the operator, but then to show um, that it existed and made sense and lots of other people have subsequently done uh, much work, which I can't really go through. Um, but the, the main thing is that this, for a single operator, of course, it's um, so it's supposed to be an elliptic object. Um, for a single operator, that just means uh, really that it's a modular form. The index is a modular form. But the proofs of this are um, indirect, let's say, and algebraic. Um, so, um, Nigel yesterday was uh, was praising the the conversion of analysis to algebra. I personally feel that one should convert the algebra into analysis, but there you go. That's what this is about in some sense. So um, amongst the things that one would really like to have are a geometric version of an appropriate elliptic cohomology. There, there are hints of that here, by the way, uh, pretty clearly. Uh, Berlinski conjectured roughly what one should do. He was missing a few vital things for other clearly, uh, and we still don't have this, but it's quite possible that um, it will come out of a proper discussion of Derek Ramond. You know, in other words, it's supposed to be an analog of K theory for the families. But if you try and do the families Derek Ramond operator, you should get an elliptic uh, version, some version of, of uh, elliptic homology. Okay, so the setting is the loop space. And so what is a loop? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's actually a good question as to what a loop is. Uh, um, the, the uh, you can see, I'm, I apologize for this um, mess. So um, what is a loop? Well, um, I'm taking a loop to be just a map from the circle. That's what a, the loop space is about. But I think technically a loop should be something much more like um, an element of this loop space, modular, modular the reparameterization uh, group acting on the circle, the diffeomorphism, the oriented, orientation preserving diffeomorphism. One of the crucial things in this whole discussion is the equivariance. So we're not just talking about a Dirac operator, we're really talking about an infinite dimensional Dirac operator, but also one which is equivariant. But we start off thinking about the actual loop space, so um, maps from the circle into the manifold. Of course, there are lots of different <laughs> degrees of regularity, and this is the one of the, thing, the things that's confusing. Um, continuous loops, you know, bad. Uh, from an analytic point of view, continuous space is very hard to deal with. Uh, finite energy loops, well, these are continuous, and so these are, this is most the most natural uh, thing to deal with. These have a nice property that continuous loops have, um, which smooth loops do not have, which somehow is where you can join two loops. Um, and in, in, uh, for H1 loops, the only condition when you join two paths, say, which are H1, is, the, is continuity. And then the resulting thing is, is L1, because the um, derivative is in H2, in L2. And so these are very useful, as you'll see. But in some sense, I think the best way to think about the loop space is to think about the smooth loop space. You might even think about smoother loop spaces than the smooth loop space, by which I mean, for example, non-stationary loops, non-stationary smooth loops, or some other dense uh, subset. So that's, it's dense in um, these other spaces, um, in the appropriate topologies, and they're all homotopy equivalent. And so in, it's certainly, I think the best way to think about it is, uh, is like sort of in distribution theory or something or other. You, you think about um, the one space and then you're thinking about the topology, different topologies on it, and you're really thinking about thickenings of it. And so, of course, one of the things to understand is we really need to discuss functions or worse on this space. And so there's a duality here. If you have a function defined on a smooth space, 
it doesn't have to be very smooth itself. But by saying that it extends even continuously to a bigger space, you're demanding more regularity. And that um, regularity is a very important part of the whole problem. Okay, so uh, there's a long history about loop spaces, which I shall just ignore, uh, unfortunately. Well, I can't go into it. Okay, so the loop space is um, a little bit at first frightening. So you can think of these different spaces as, as uh, manifolds in, uh, you know, in the traditional sense, um, Barnack manifold, the continuous ones, and they, they are smooth manifolds as Barnack manifolds. It, it takes a little getting used to it, but there's nothing non-smooth. It's really, um, they see infinity manifolds in the traditional sense um, but Banach, Hilbert, and Frechet. And so one's used to sort of worrying about Frechet's manifolds and so forth. But uh, the worry about these spaces as, I mean, even thinking about them in these terms is slightly, is seriously misleading. The reason is that they come from uh, manifolds. And so um, these, are, these are really modeled on smooth functions on uh, the circle. Uh, and they have a structure group. These spaces, for example, the smooth one has a structure group, which is much. So if you thought about this as abstract manifolds, you would have to think about smooth functions on open subsets of a fresh A space, which you do not wish to think about, or I do not wish to think about. But in fact, the structure group is far smaller. Um, so this is the uh, reparameterization on the circle. Um, and this is diffeomorphisms of the manifold, which can depend parametrically on uh, the point on the circle. And so uh, I won't go through the discussion, but this is the structure group. And this means that they're much more like finite dimensional manifolds than you might at first think. They're of course not finite dimensional manifolds. In particular, they have very nice uh, open sets, um, which uh, are these um, tubes, tubular domains. So, uh, of course, these occur in these different ways. But if you think about, uh, so I, I shall be very casual about writing L of M, what I mean, because it's, you, you maybe just have to think about the correct topology. But uh, the, in all these cases, you get um, these uh, tubular domains, which are just the paths or the loops, uh, which at each point, so you, you're thinking in the manifold, at each point, the base, uh, so the base loop here has a value and you just look at all the loops which at each point take values in say a ball uh, in the manifold, we're thinking it's a Riemannian manifold. And this is a nice domain, it's a tubular domain, open, contractible, uh, and these give, for example, a good open cover of uh, the loop spaces and one can do lots of things uh, directly using these tubular domains. And so they're much, it's, it's, it's basically like the covering of a finite dimensional manifold by um, geodesic balls. Okay, so um, all this part is relatively easy. So what about the, uh, the, the some serious um, discussion? So <laughs> what we're talking about here is the string structure on the manifold. Um, and so uh, this is given you know, traditionally topologically in terms of the Whitehead Tower. So we're taking a manifold, we're giving it, if you like, a Riemannian uh, structure. And so we're reducing the tangent bundle, smooth manifold, reducing the tangent bundle to uh, a, 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 a bundle with structure group ON. So we have a, a frame bundle of uh, orthonormal normal frames at each point. And then you can ask, for refinements of that, successive refinements, which are just related to the Whitehead Tower uh, of ON, which is say, to say they're related to the homotopy groups of ON. So of course, the basic one is the fact that there are two components of ON. So N here is, remember, supposed to be somewhat large-ish, at least like three here or something or other, but larger so I don't have to say anything. Um, and then uh, this is the notion of an orientation, as we'll see. Then uh, pi one of S O N is Z two. Uh, and this is the notion of a spin structure. So um, there is a spin cover of S O N which kills. So the Whitehead Tower, what we're doing is we're killing successive uh, homotopy groups as a topologist would like to do. And so you can continue forever. That's what Whitehead says. The groups tend to get nastier. So spin we're very familiar with S O and we're very familiar with string, one's less familiar with, but string is killing pi three 
of um, uh, so n or spin n. Um, and the, uh, the point is that any non-commutative um, finite dimensional standard Lie group has to have pi three non-zero. Basically, it has to have an, uh, an SU two in it um, or lots of them. And so it has non-contractible spheres. And um, so this cannot be a Lie group. So this is one of the hard parts. Exists as a topological group. I mean, it, in the Whitehead Tower, it's only defined up to multiple equivalents. But you can get pretty good realizations, or other people got pretty good realizations of this, um, which I won't go into um, because it's exactly trying to avoid this. So no, no matter how you think about this, the the um, the kernel of this map. So it has to be subjective. That's the idea. But the kernel uh, has to correspond to this pi three. So it has to be uh, essentially a KZ2. Um, and there aren't any very nice KZ2s. There aren't any finite dimensional smooth KZ2. You can think of this as PU or something or other. But um, that means that this group can't be very nice for analysis. And so, um, of course, so there's no way somehow of avoiding that. Um, but we do our best. So, as I say, the Whitehead Tower is going up here on the left. Um, the uh, corresponding structures on the manifold are orientation. Um, the, uh, so here, this is the existence of an orientation, existence of a spin structure, existence of a string structure. So in each case, there's relatively straightforward obstruction. I don't know about the next one. If you wish to become a mathematical physicist, you can think about five frame structures up here somewhere, but we have enough trouble with string structures. So a string structure is a well-defined object um, and we need to discuss its existence. So this, these are successive coverings uh, after this one. This of course is a sub bundle, um, but these are coverings of the, of the corresponding principal bundle by principal bundle with the bigger um, structure group, which then uh, maps naturally to it. So, of course, we know spin uh, is the vanishing of W2. And then there are several spin structures. Um, and string uh, is the vanishing uh, of this uh, class half P1 in H4 of the manifold. So half P1 is an integral class. This is, of course, I don't know who was the clever one who called it half P1. But it's the um, Contriagan class of the spin frame bundle. Uh, which is an integral class, twice which is the Pontryagin class of the uh, orthogonal bundle. So that's why it's called half P1. But it's a well-defined integral class. And the vanishing of that is the equivalent to the existence of a string structure. This was a theorem uh, of, uh, uh, well, I'll come back to it, of uh, Redden, I think, finally. But anyway, so let's just talk about orientation um, and spin to try and get things uh, clear. So how am I going to go for time here? Okay, I'm doing fine. Um, so orientation, well, uh, so this is the um, non-oriented frame bundle, just the ortho, orthonormal frame bundle, that an orientation, you can think of it in a lot of different ways, but one sensible way of thinking about it is, of course, as a, a map defined as a smooth function or a continuous function defined on the um, previous bundle, on the bundle of orthonormal frames valued in Z2, which is continuous, hence smooth, because of the value in Z2, and supposed to take both values on each fiber. So, um, so this is what an orientation is. Now, why do I go through the trouble of defining an orientation? Well, um, the, the, once we have an orientation, then a spin structure is identified with the um, refinement to uh, this double cover, which is, so both of these happen to be Z2, which is confusing, but this is a double cover of the frame bundle by uh, a spin bundle. So these orientation, these classes, W2 uh, here and W1 there, rise really from uh, trans transgression um, from the fiber bundle to the base, which I'll try and describe briefly. So I did note this will, F will be the spin frame bundle when it exists, because that's somehow the central character in what we're doing here. Okay, so, um, so now let's think about the relationship. So um, one of the issues is why is the spin, the frame, why is the, the loop space important? Well, um, 
one way to understand it is to think about the relationship between spin structures on the manifold and the um, the loop bundle. So this was already done in the 80s. Atiyah observed the following fact. So first of all, there's a sort of functorial, you can always do a functorial transgression. So here we have the uh, this bundle over the, the manifold. This is also a manifold. So of course you can think about the loops in it. And um, the loop in here, a loop in here always, for this is a vibration, always projects to a loop in the base. So you get this pulled back object, the loops in the in any reasonable bundle map to the loops. And but if it's a principal bundle, then the structure group is the loop group on the corresponding structure group because you're just relating pointwise. So you're looking at two loops which map to the same point in each fiber. And so they're related by an element of the structure group and hence by a, a, a totally by a loop space. Loop. So you always get a pulled back bundle over the loop space, um, which whatever else is certainly a nice topological manifold. So if you don't worry about the smoothness, um, you get it. So if you think about um, the uh, special orthogonal group, then as I said, pi one is Z2. So this group here, uh, which is the loop group has two components corresponding to whether the loop is contractible or not. Um, and so um, it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but the, the identity component is canonically identified with loop spin. In fact, this of course is one of the standard constructions of the loop of the spin um, group by um, using the loop space and taking a big quotient. So you can ask here whether this principal bundle has a refinement to um, where the structure group drops from the loops on the orthogonal, special orthogonal to the loops and spin. And <clears throat> so Tia observed that uh, in the eighties, that um, if you take, um, the, if you have a spin manifold, then there is such a, uh, a, a uh, refinement. So a spin structure on M corresponds to a loop orientation uh, so it's called an orientation because it looks a little bit like the uh, standard case of orientation, namely this has two components. And uh, you know, so I call it the loop orientation. Other people just call it the orientation of the loop space. <clears throat> okay, so you can understand this in terms of holonomy and so forth, but I, I want to go too much uh, detail. So really the, the, the map U that I was talking about, so just corresponding to what I said before, there should be a map for an orientation, a map from here. That map is really the holonomy of the um, spin bundle on uh, the manifold. So you're doing a transgression from holonomy of the spin bundle to uh, an orientation on the manifold. Okay, so uh, Atiyah observed this, that a string structure does imply the existence of a, um, an orient a loop orientation on the uh, loop space. When McLaughlin showed, this is back in the 80s, uh, that this is, the converse is also true uh, if M is simply connected, but uh, not uh, in general. Um, and this was really only completely clarified um, uh, you know, this millennium by Stoltz and Teichner. Um, this, the notion of fusion already existed, but um, they uh, made it rather clear. So let's think about, instead of the loop space, think about the path space. So these are, uh, I won't go through the, the path spaces are very similar to the loop spaces, except you have um, no closed condition. So if you have the, the path space on a, on a manifold, you get a map, which is just the endpoint evaluation map back to M squared. So uh, this really is a vibration. It's a fiber bundle in the nicest sense. So Maybe that's not quite obvious, but it, it is. And so you, you know, local structure of this is, um, is constant near the endpoints. So you can form the fiber product. So this is the simplicial space out of this fiber bundle. Um, so you just take, in other words, pairs of paths which have the same endpoint. And there's a map here. Um, from, um, so somehow from the pairs of paths of the fiber product uh, into the loop space, which is obvious if you draw a picture, namely you've got two paths going between the same endpoints. And so if you reverse the second one, you have to think about the, the parameterization space, but you can have a fixed relation of the parameters. So you go out for the first half along here and then back 
uh, reverse the second path, you get a map into loops. And for finite energy um, loops, this is an isomorphism. So um, if you look at finite energy maps, the loops, then each of them can be decomposed uniquely into two finite energy paths in the fiber space. So um, there is this um, construction relationship between um, the fiber product identification, really, between the fiber product of the path space and the loop space. So uh, what did Stoltz and Teichner observed. So, I mean, they didn't quite put it in this form, but um, if you now think of this as a simplicial space, so you can always construct a simplicial space from a fiber bundle where the successive spaces are just the successive fiber product. So this is three paths all with the same endpoint. And so it's a simplicial space. You have three paths with the same endpoints. Um, you get two maps back. So this is the simplicial structure, two maps back to the double space where you, where you drop one of the three paths and, and um, maybe keep the orientation in mind. Um, and so there's a map um, here um, from, uh, from the, uh, this means we have a map back to the loop space, uh, three maps back to the loop space because it's the fiber product of the path space. And so um, there's a relationship that you can think of which is usually called fusion uh, between the, so if you've got a you've got a function defined on um, the path space, um, I mean sorry on the loop space, um, you can say well if I pull it back um, to the triple path space uh, in these two different ways, um, which is to say this way and this way, then in some sense you can think of the middle one maybe canceling, and so you get this possible uh, identity, say for a multiplicative function, uh, but in other ways there. So this is basically, this is true um, for the, um, the holonomy, uh, as I said, of the spin bundle. And so this fusion condition is somehow very important in <laughs> behavior of the thing. So this is what Stoltz and Teichner said, that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between spin structures on M and fusive loop orientations. So this means that the, um, the orientation function thought of as a Z2 valued function on the loop space has to have this additional multiplicative property. Notice that this connects uh, non, I mean, connects elements in different components of the loop space. So it's not true, of course, that these three paths, these three loops that you get uh, have to be in the same, uh, define the same element in pi one, for example. And so there is a global component to this fusion structure. So what this is doing in some sense is trying to tell you which functions on the loop space come from functions on the manifold. If anyone has any questions, they're welcome to uh, pipe in. Okay, so, um, and so, and th this is a one-to-one -one map. So here is just a quick discussion of the uh, proof of uh, Stoltz-Teichner. So how do you go back? Well, um, it's really relatively straightforward. You just start off with the loop space uh, on um, the, this is the frame bundle. And um, so now you, I mean, what you're given is a loop, uh, so a fusion um, orientation on, uh, the loop space with the properties that I described before. And so you just take the product with Z2, the trivial Z2 bundle over the path space, and then you take the identification, use, you use U as descent data. So you say two things are equivalent if um, the, the paths uh, define this, and, so, and this is true for the, for the loop relation. And from this, you can uh, easily see that you get a double cover of FSO and that's the spin bundle. So this actually constructs the spin bundle. Well, you might object actually that it constructs the, the bundle over the two copies if you look into it more carefully. Uh, that's a rather typical thing here, which I, I won't worry about. The point is that what you're actually constructing is a simplicial version of the frame bundle. You can just restrict one of the points to fix one of the points in the base and then you get the standard spin structure or you can observe that this is just a, um, so somehow this is a simplicial object and because it's exact, simplicity exact, it actually comes from an object, but either way. Um, that's another thing that's in the back. Okay, so that's Stoltz and Teichner. So what Stoltz and Teichner tell you is that you should be careful in thinking about 
taking structures on the manifold and moving them to the loop space. It's not that it isn't possible. Uh, it's just that they have additional structure, in particular, this fusion structure. And so um, Chris and I wrote down a version of this. So one of the things we're doing uh, typically here is transgression. If you think about cohomology classes on the manifold example, you can, of course, pull them back under the evalu evaluation map. So you've got this map from uh, the loop space into the manifold, which is evaluating a loop at a point. Um, and then, so you can pull back a cohomology class, whatever, I mean, in a, in a cohomological sense. Uh, and then since uh, U1, this, this circle is uh, oriented, you can push it forward. And this is the standard transgression map from forms. So you, you have a, a transgression map from forms, whatever, cohomology, and plenty of other objects too, on uh, M to corresponding things on the loop space. This is never, in, in general, neither injective nor surjective. Um, but you can correct it to, a subject, to an isomorphism, and that's really uh, sort of uh, the same idea as, as in Stoltz and Teichner. What you can do is you can define a different, so I'm doing it here in Czech cohomology, so using, if you like, the tubular domains to give you a good open cover, you can define a, a map which um, goes to an augmented cohomology. So this is Czech cohomology, but with additional conditions, namely the fusion conditions um, and uh, an additional condition which is, corresponds to this uh, simplicity thing I mentioned before. So you can make an isomorphism where you get uh, Czech cohomology shifted in dimension as the Czech cohomology of LM with these fusion conditions. And then uh, this is just the forgetful map here where you drop the additional conditions and you get the standard transgression. Uh, map. Uh, and so this is a good way of understanding how, I mean, that's in some sense what Stoltz and Teichner are doing for the for, um, W2. Okay, um, so now to the <laughs> point. So I, I'm Let's just, I hope I'm not going too slowly here. So what about string structures? So as I said, the string structure is the next one up from the spin structure. Um, and it corresponds to asking for a string covering of the spin frame bundle, where this is a string group, this is the spin group, and this of course is consistent um, principal bundle. No, uh, and so this was shown eventually by Redin um, in complete detail that string structure exists if and only if um, the, this half P1 is zero. And then you can um, see that there's a torsor of them, if you like, they're classified by H3 of the spin bundle. No, uh, up here, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so um, one knows what a string structure is, but <clears throat> so the idea of the string theorist is that the, this really is supposed to give you something much more. There are various conjectures about what it gives you. Like a spin structure, you're, you're, it's supposed to be related to uh, the um, Ritchie curvature of the manifold and so forth, but um, we haven't got there yet. Okay, so um, the idea is of Witten really in, in string theory is that you can move the string structure to the loop space. So this was done, you know, with um, problems in the 80s, and now it's it's done properly. So the main thing to realize is that the loops on spin have central extensions. So this is not really so surprising if you think about it, um, because the spin has pi three, uh, and actually no com no cohomology below that, and so h three of spin uh, is z. Uh, integral H3 of spin is Z, typical for a Lie group, but I mean, there may be problems because there may be something below it. But um, then the transgression theorem that I just described is that H2, this um, uh, fusion cohomology of the loop space on spin should uh, be Z. Uh, and therefore there are circle bundles uh, and in fact, there are fusive circle bundles over loop spin, and these are all central extensions. So this is actually all the cohomology here is equivariant, um, and they are. There is in fact an, a, a, a central extension for each element here, which of course means there's a z of central extension. 
but um, they're all somehow, there's a basic one and then they're all essentially tensor powers of it. So this uh, set extension, which you can find in many different ways, it's been known for a long time and I can't unfortunately go through the whole history of it. Waldorf pointed out um, that this is a fusion property, um, which hardly is surprising from the point of view that I'm describing here. Namely, if you think of this as a circle bundle over the loop space, and you pull back the circle bundles under these maps that I described for these three paths through each point as maps from the loop space to uh, the, this triple path space, um, there's a relationship between uh, a natural relationship. And of course, this is a simplicial relationship. You have to remember that there's an isomorphism here, but not only is there an isomorphism, but you can go up the next step. There's a canonical isomorphism that reduces to that and so on. Anyway, um, so this is there are always these central extensions and these central extensions are very important for what we're doing. So these are capturing uh, pi three of the uh, spin. Um, and so um, they're related to uh, the string structure. Okay, and so um, uh, this uh, actually gives part of the, anyway, uh, so let's, let's just go on. I uh, run out of time if I'm not careful. So um, the loop spin structure. So this is, um, the question that I'm asking before, um, now over the manifold, we've got a spin manifold. We've got the loops in the spin frame bundle over the loop space of the manifold as a loop spin bundle, principal bundle. And uh, we're asking the question, you can always ask, this is a gerb type question. You can ask um, whether this has a refinement now that we've got a central extension. So it's only a one dimensional refinement of the loop uh, on spin, so that's not we're writing it, but we can ask whether we can uh, lift this uh, bundle to a bundle with structured group, um, the central extension. This, of course, is abstracted. Um, you can't always do it. And so, uh, and you need a little bit more. You want it to be uh, you know, equivariant and you want it to be lots of things. Um, so uh, that's really the question. When can you... Um, Get. So this is what we mean by loop spin structure, a refinement of the loops in spin over the loop space to have structure group, the central extension. And uh, you want it to be fusion and so forth, uh, as you can guess here. And we want it to be equivariant, actually. So I, I don't have time really to explain the relationship between equivariance and fusion. But in some sense, fusion should really be thought of, which is why I use this term fusive, as the um, not only this relationship between paths, but somehow another condition, which is quite sort of orthogonal to this one, which is equivariance under the reparameterization action of the circle on loops. So you can see that this doesn't correspond very well to fusion, because if you start moving around on the loops, you, you break the fusion. So these are very strong conditions and they're orthogonal, which makes life hard, but it's the combination of them that's hard. So really, ultimately, it turns out this uh, loop spin bundle, uh, when it exists, will have an action of the diffeomorphism group of the circle. Well, um, actually, the uh, uh, a central extension of that, which is the bot virasora group, uh, and the L-hat spin. So it's a principal bundle for this, but it's equivariant for this. This is what one wants. Uh, and one also wants smoothness, and one wants... Um, Lots of other things. So you want everything you can possibly get to make this as smooth as possible. So McLaughlin already showed um, that um, this is true uh, if the manifold. So this is back in the 80s. And again, it's the same problem. There was no fusion. Um, Waldorf uh, in the early 2000s or, or 2010 showed that there's a topological uh, version of it provided, how, provided there's a spin structure. So um, that the Trend, the condition here is the same as the condition for the existence of a string structure. A string structure on the manifold is a loop, a fusive loop spin structure. And then Chris Kotker and I uh, did this much more smoothly, which is what we need here. Um, topological things won't buy you much. Okay, so that is the end of part one. We have, uh, we know when there's a spin structure on the man, a, a loop spin structure on the loop space, even only if there's a string structure. I'll, I'll go through the proof here, but I don't want to uh, take. So the proof really involves this, our proof, and this somehow the simplest way of understanding this is in terms of this 
Berlinsky, McLaughlin, by gerb. Well, I mean, they wrote down a gerb, which is um, Murray's um, lifting gerb for the central extension. But if you write it down more carefully, you get a by gerb, a, a by simplicial object, which is what Chris and I wrote down. So this is starting from this picture where you just have the manifold, you have the path space on the manifold, you have two copies because you've got two copies in the manifold, you've got two copies of the spin frame bundle, and you've got loops, uh, paths in the spin frame bundle. And these are compatible, if you think about it, just it's the projection, and meaning that there's a map to the fiber product of these two things, which is just the fiber over at the endpoints. Um, and this picture not only commutes, but everything's a vibration. And so when you have uh, some picture like this, it means that you get a bisimplicial. You don't always have a bisimplicial. So here's you know, a big picture. So, but all we're doing here is writing down the um, simplicial um, data for the loops for the path space uh, on M and the simplicial data for the loop space, uh, on, well, for the powers here for, uh, for the loop space on M. So both of these turn out to be just the simplicial products. And the, the fact that we have this uh, commutative square um, with this nice property in the middle means that uh, this commutes. So when you do the construction this way, it's the same as the construction this way. So these two things somehow have, um, interpretations from either point of view, and you get this doubly simplicial diagram where everything commutes in the appropriate sense. And so what, I won't try and go through this, but this is the basis of the proof uh, of the um, equivalence of string and loop spin structures. So that there is a circle bundle over this space here. The circle bundle, if you think about what this is, I mean, maybe it's hard to understand. This is loops in the um, fiber product of F with itself uh, over M. And so this means you've got two um, loops um, which are always in the same fiber. And so they're related by an element of loop spin and loop spin has this uh, central extension, which means you can find a map from here to loop spin or you can pull back the central extension. That gives you a circle bundle over this, which is a, this is the Murray's construction for a gerb, but this is a bi, simplicial object. So that circle bundle, if you pull it back to here, it's trivial and it has a trivialized, but it has a trivialization, which is the canonical trivialization here. And similarly, if we go up here and if you pull back these two traits, so on. So, and that, the triviality, the simplicial triviality of that uh, circle bundle, which means whether it's trivial when you pull it back here or here, um, it's the same going this way as that way. And when you do that, when you understand what's going on, this is where you get the loop spin bundle constructed from the triviality of that. Uh, and it, it corresponds to the vanishing of half P1 and you see that this way. So anyway, so this picture sort of encapsulates how you can go from uh, the spin frame bundle. Now, so that's the first thing that we need <laughs> for the Dirac Raymond operator is the um, spin structure on the loop space. Then we need the uh, spinner bundle and the spinner bundle, of course, in the finite dimensional case comes from the uh, identification of the fundamental representation of the spin group, or if you like embedding it in the Clifford algebra and so forth. Um, for loop spin, there's, uh, for loop groups on finite dimensional Lie groups, there's a very similar, very big theory going starting in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s of positive energy representations. And so this, if you consult the book of, um, Presley and Siegel, that's what it's about. Um, and so these are pretty fully classified. There's a nice recent paper of Fried, or well, not very so recent anymore, Fried, Hopkins, and Telemann, giving you a complete classification of them in terms of twisted K theory. But the point is that there are such representations. So they're positive energy. So this, what this is saying is that these are representations, the unitary representations of, not of the loop group, but of the central extensions of the loop group that are So they're projective representations, but they're then representations of the central extension, they're positive energy. Now, what this means is that they actually have, they um, actually have actions, as I said before, the central extension of the group and of the reparameterization action of the circle on loops. So this is a semi-direct product where this thing is acting on this. Um, and that means that inside here, it's perhaps not obvious, but there still is the rotation group sits in here naturally. 
And so the rotation group acts on these representations and the positive energy condition is the fact that the infinitesimal generator of that is bounded below. And so these are um, the good representations in some sense, and they've been completely classified. It's not uh, something that I can write down uh, simply, but they, they are completely classified. So the, the one we really want to talk about is the spin rep, so-called spin representation. Somehow the notation is pretty confusing. <laughs> the spin representation of um, spin 2n. So this is actually the level one representation of spin 2n. And it appears, uh, you know, you can construct it in the course as always for representation, there are a lot of different ways, but the representation space is the Fox space. So this is really an infinite dimensional exterior algebra. Um, and uh, it's a Hilbert space and, uh, and this act. So it's, a, it's um, you're not the exterior algebra to N, but it's an infinite dimensional exterior algebra. And so the loop spinner bundle so once we've got a, a smooth principal bundle and a representation of that um, principal bundle, we get a, a spinner bundle over the loop space. And so this is our second part of, the, uh, of what we need to define the Dirac Raymond. We've got this. Now, as always, I, I'm trying to explain that um, these things are not, um, I mean, it, there's more to be said about the structure of uh, these things. So um, they're normally given in the, uh, in the representation theory literature as Hilbert spaces. So the representation of Hilbert spaces, uh, in fact, you know, typically given infinitesimally as representations of the Lie algebra. But uh, here they really are representations of the group. This is all explained in, in Presley Siegel. But um, the representation actually has uh, a fresh A subspace, um, which is preserved by the action, uh, and a dual fresh A. So there's really, uh, just like the loop space itself, there's a whole lot of things in between. There's a very smooth part, there's the L2 part, the Hilbert space in the middle, and then there's the dual, you might think of as tempered distributions. Now, unfortunately, or maybe <laughs> significantly anyway, um, these, this fresh A space, um, which is just a rep, the sort of, it's not the smooth action of the uh, loop space, loop bundle itself, it's, the, it's for the, uh, it's the smooth vectors for the action of this extended group. But anyway, um, it uh, is a, you know, a fresh A space, and it looks a bit like the Schwartz space on you know, Rn, R2n, but it's not. Um, it's not isomorphic to that. And this is sort of important to understand because it, it, it's behind a lot of the analytic property problems that occur immediately. So why not? Well, it's, it is you know, a separable, this is a separable Hilbert space and this Schwartz space has a countable sort of thing basis, sort of like the Fourier basis but it's not parameterized by the integers. What is parameterized is by finite subsets of the positive integers. So these are particle states. So this is, this is a Fox space. And so the basis corresponds to particles or perhaps antiparticles, I don't know. But anyway, the finite subsets of the integers, positive integers, arbitrary finite subsets. Now the finite subsets of the integers are you know, form a countable set um, but the problem is that this countable set is definitely not ordered uh, in any sensible way. And correspondingly, um, what you might think of as the Sobolev spaces, which do play a role here. Um, my student, uh, Kavya Valvetti, worked out a lot of this. Um, they are the, the, Schwartz, the Hilbert spaces. For example, the, the successive Hilbert spaces, you can work out what they should, the Sobolev spaces, I mean, uh, you can work out what they should be, and they're compactly uh, you know, mapped into each other in the way that they are on Rn, but never, never um, are they trace class or free time. So, uh, or, or um, Hilbert Schmidt, for example. So the trouble is that the growth here, so what this looks like is it looks like a space with uh, functions on the line with arbitrary logarithmic differentiability. 
So somehow um, you never get above any uh, arbitrary sort of logarithmic power of differentiability. And so there's never um, trace class inclusions. And this is one of the reasons that there's a serious problem, or I mean, it's maybe just uh, explains the serious problem of writing down traces, which is exactly what we want to do. Okay, so anyway, with all that, here is the Dirac Ramond operator. Now, I'm still lying a bit here, unfortunately, but I, I guess I don't really have time to try and explain exactly what. So this is the path that you expect. Um, we do get a connection. Um, this, you know, this uh, spinner bundle is only somehow, uh, I mean, the, the loop spin bundle is only one dimensional larger than the loop bundle. The levi chiwita connection does transgress to a connection on the loop on this uh, bundle. And so for the central extension, it's just one dimension more, and we can find a nice invariant connection. It's not unique, um, but it's just like spin C, if you like. Um, and so you can write down this operator. Now, the, you have to, I didn't have time to talk about the Clifford action. Uh, and indeed, this is one of the problems here. What, the reason that this has really not been done historically is that people were trying to think of the Hilbert space bundle of spinners. And then when you take some derivative here, you get what are unbounded operators on the Hilbert space. And so you can never get back to the uh, Hilbert uh, space of the fiber at each point with this operator. Uh, and that's essentially the reason it wasn't defined historically. So on the other hand, if you start off, for example, with a section of the smooth bundle and you make enough assumptions about the place, the, the loop at which you're doing the derivation, you can get back to the Hilbert bundle and maybe, I mean, or to the dual. Now, notice that this doesn't look quite like the, <laughs> The uh, spin Dirac operator. This looks like the spin Dirac operator and it has a name in physics. I don't know, I forget what, like the plane Dirac Ramond operator or something or other. Um, in order to make it equivariant with respect to the uh, Bot Virasoro action, you have to add an extra term. This extra term is really, again, Clifford multiplication. It's Clifford multiplication. I don't know whether that I is supposed to be there. Anyway, Clifford multiplication by the. Um, tangent vector to the to the loop at which you're uh, working things out. So this is uh, uh, required to make the thing equivariant and it comes out of the usual formulation. Okay, so um, as I said, my definition of this is still weak. Um, and uh, let's see. So um, I'm going to stop in a moment. So uh, what, I mean, what can I actually do? Well, what we can actually do is work out what's happened on the torus. It's a start um, and even there, there are problems, but um, so this is basically because Sfera and Wurzbacher, not that long ago, 10 years ago, um, worked out uh, some, you know, L2 version of the Dirac Ramond operator on R2N. Now, of course, if we think about the torus, it turns out that the loop space of the torus, of course, the pi one of the torus is um, relatively large. Um, so there are lots of components, but if you look at the component, the contractile component of loops, it actually is this. This is not, I mean, this if you like is the initial point, uh, but not quite. So this is actually an average of the loop. Um, so there really are the pointed loops in R2N. So these are just the loops in R2N that start and finish at the origin. And so this is a natural identification of the loops. So you can use the uh, loops on R2N um, as a linear, you know, as a group, and you can use the linear structure on R2N to analyze what's going on. Um, this is what Spiro and Wurzbach did directly on R2N. But if you translate it uh, to the torus, what you can see is that this Dirac Ramond operator um, decomposes into an infinite sum. So the terms here are the Fourier components of the loops. And so there's really, of course, a, an R2N somewhere in the background here as well. So there's a tensor where the things on R2N, but on each, so this is a Fourier component, which is the E to the I um, K theta and E to the minus I K theta. So you're combining the two, um, the Dirac Ramond operator really does decompose into an infinite number of uh, operators on uh, what's really C, what's really R2, um, with uh, values in, in the two-dimensional forms corresponding to, R, to, to C. 
And so um, you can write it down explicitly. Uh, it's consistent with what I wrote down before. And these operators you can analyze explicitly, I mean, as operators on, on R2. Um, and um, they are sort of are obviously related to the harmonic oscillator, but not really the harmonic oscillator. What they correspond to, they have infinite dimensional null space, each of these operators, which is really the Bargman space. So um, what you're talking about here, when you look at all these terms together, is you're looking at this uh, string Ga Gaussian. Somehow this plays a fundamental role in the picture, at least uh, I believe it does. And so in each dimension, what you're getting is a holomorphic uh, function um, multiplying this, if you like in L2, so a polynomial um, multiplying this. And that and the null space, that's what the null space consists of. And all the other part is non-zero. And you can check that these are exactly the, the elements of positive energy. Um, and so uh, it's in this case, you can work out everything. For the torus, you can work out everything. I didn't put it down in detail, but you can get the formula formula that Witten has. Of course, the torus is not, ter not terribly interesting. I didn't say the spin structure is trivial, the string structure is trivial, uh, and the uh, index is therefore trivial. All you get is the non geometric part of the index uh, that uh, Witten wrote down in this uh, spin context. Um, but it's reassuring that you can actually get the same formula. There's still problems uh, even in, in understanding the, the uh, for me at least, in understanding the derivative monopoly. But what I hope to do, um, first of all, as I said, it's weakly defined and I would like to get the Dirk Ramond operator as a genuine map between some space of sections and some other space of sections. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, what one would ultimately really like to show is that the null space of the Dirk Ramond operator um, is, so it, it will automatically, I mean, any reasonable definition will give you a, a space with with an action of the bot virasora group. So what you ultimately hope is that the null space and the null space of the adjoint are, um, uh, have finite multiplicity over the representations. So the representations of this are well known. There's basically only one, I mean, up to, well, up to the same um, level business. Um, and um, then uh, what you expect is that Witten's formula is given just as a multiplicity. So these, these finite dimensional spaces just give you multiplicities. And what you're supposed to do is take the traces of these um, representations of diff class. So the problem there is even the, rep I mean, that those traces, as I was trying to explain, are formal traces. It would be nice if one could really do that uh, rigorously, I mean, in a sense too. But um, one of the things that's important I was trying to emphasize why, why is this still hard to me anyway, is that once forced into these H a half loops, that's sort of uh, what this Gaussian is telling you. These, uh, this is H a half regularity for loops here. And H a half um, is not continuous. And so uh, this is very hard to deal with H a half loops, but it's sort of somehow forced on one to do it uh, at some level or other. And so what I ultimately hope is that one can move the discussion of the torus, one can localize it to an arbitrary manifold and hence discuss the steric Ramond operator um, in uh, that context. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Anyone still alive? Yeah, That's what yeah. I always think <laughs> in these talks. You know, does anyone survive in the audience? So any questions? Uh, I think Faye probably has. Yeah, so, so Richard, so uh, when you're talking about a Hilbert bundle or Frechet bundle, does that correspond to various kinds of loop space, right? For example, Hilbert bundle, that is... Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, in a way, I mean, in other words, you need... Um, remember that, that even the... Even, <laughs> even the finite energy space is a smooth manifold. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's somewhat counterintuitive. Yes, um, you, you really do expect the, 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 I mean, in other words, the, the, that space is, the problem is the action, but yes, it's defined even over the, the finite energy loop. But um, really, yeah, I mean, that, 
um, you're that's part of the weakness in the definition that you have to pass to the smooth loop space in order to do it. Um, but um, it seems to be dense, and we just I just need some sort of continuity to under to understand the extension to the Hilbert one. But yes, it's really the same as the regularity of the loop space. It's not directly connected to it, but yes, it is. Mm. So that means on um, a smooth loop space, uh, you consider for sure bundle, right? Or uh, and on uh, um, uh, continuous loop space, maybe on uh, L two loop space, something you consider uh, Hilbert bundle, something like this. Right, 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 right. But of course, the Hilbert bundle, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and for the torus case, uh, the, the operators they defined uh, does that coincide with the uh, weak operator? With a wick, Witten, Witten operator. I mean, the well, formal. Um, uh, I mean, that's very hard to say. It. This is the. I mean, it's it's really the Ramond op, Ramond's definition. It, so it, it is the same operator as Witten's talking about. Witten, of course, is only ever talking about it localized near the constant mm -hmm. loops. Um, and so um, it's a bit hard to say it's the same operator because I'm not sure he really has it. But th this is pretty much. This is really what. Um, uh, Spiro and Wurzbacher did on R2N. Of course, their, their theorem is a little vague because they have to sort of do, they have to kill some infinite dimensional irrelevant null space because of the compactness of non-compactness of R2N. But yes, this really is the, uh, the same operator as Witten was talking about, absolutely. It comes, mm -hmm. you can see the derivation, the physicist's derivation in Spiro and Wurzbacher. It just comes from, you know, the standard Lagrangian formalism. And that's right. why you get this extra uh, which I've no so the extra the equivariant part is showing up here as these uh, zeroth order terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the high frequency uh, terms here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, so this is the this is the the plane Dirac operator, mm -hmm. um, and this is the action of the tangent vector field on the on the spin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But indeed, but, it is the same. So the interesting thing is this function here, that this is the, my hope for proceeding, this function or this function, um, you see, this is as close as you can get to an invariant metric on the loop space. The problem, one of the problems is like, you're talking about the Clifford bundle, what, a Clifford bundle of what? Um, because mm -hmm. there, isn't a, there isn't an invariant metric. Um, because like, I mean, if you try and make it invariant, you of course um, wreck the smoothness. But this hard, this is corresponds to, to the Hardy space of H and half loops, but that's not uh, surprising. So this form is really the form with, re with re which the Clifford action is taken if you look at what's happening. So if you think of the, the Clifford action, which you can write down, this rescaled Clifford action with respect to the half H and half norm is almost certainly what one needs. This function almost makes sense on an arbitrary uh, loop. I have a quick question, uh, yeah. kind of curiosity. You know, you <laughs> direct, direct Raymond when you square it. Uh, yeah. You yeah, sort of expect a uh, whites and box kind of thing. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Presumably, but yeah. it's <laughs> you know, first order operator is hard enough. Uh, yeah. first, I, I I thought about thinking about it. I have not done it. Feel free is my is my. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I think for example, it would be relatively straightforward to see. I mean, you know, in the in the for the torus, yeah. Uh, the the uh, d plus is actually subjective. It has no null space anyway, and so presumably the Weizenbach formula there would give you that. I don't know. You can see it explicitly in using right. this decomposition. But, um, yeah, um, you know, there's all sorts of things one would like to do, but the Weizenbach formula presumably has a Ritchie curvature in it. That would be great, yeah. Ah, of course yeah. it would be great. Are we going to leave it? For, to vary, so Richard, even we don't worry about analytic difficulties, just the algebraically do the Weizenbach uh, form, uh, square of it, we still cannot uh, see the Ritchie. I, I don't know. Um, it should be possible to do that computation if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, at a formal level, um, I don't really see why one couldn't do that computation. 
Well, I think... Uh, I mean, I know know why I can't do the competition. (laughs) The the reason I can't do it is I have to know the answer (laughs) before I can do any computation. And I don't know what the answer is. But but Um, I think Dan Fried did it in one special case for Lee groups, I think, if I'm not... uh, None of it's some special case. Yeah, special case uh, on Lee groups. And here to differentiate... Yeah, and of the Lee group case, uh, yeah... Yeah. It was pretty ugly there also, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. well, it, I mean, obviously, the, the equivariant term makes a difference mm. um, for a start. I mean, the other part really does look remarkably like an infinite dimensional sort of flat Dirac operator. Yeah. But with the equivariant term, it becomes sort of, I mean, Spiro and Wurzbacher say it's a harmonic oscillator, which, you know, it's not. <laughs> it's it's um, it is the Bargman decomposition. So it sort of corresponds when you look at, at the harmonic oscillated oscillated. I mean, look at Hamid polynomials. It it's not you know it's not elliptic. <laughs> it's right. got an it's got it's it's like D bar rather than than um, uh, the Laplacian. So I don't know what what would happen. Okay, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, as yeah. I say, it's hard for me to do computations. Yeah. So, Guliang, you had a question. Is this, uh, you said. Well, actually, that was my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my answer is, you know, if you would like me to give you some pointers about what you need to compute, I'm happy to do so. But I don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the the local structure is pretty straightforward. You can basically tell. Because you can localize on the loop space, you can tell that the only thing that's involved is really the GD's ex- expansion around the loop. Um, that's the only thing that can be involved in the next order terms. So around the loop, which you can, like pointwise, in other words, at each point you input your money normal coordinates. Then, then the, the the flat part of the Dirac operator just looks, you know, it looks like the covariant derivative, you know, so that you'll only get the curve. You can only get the curvature terms. That's for sure. Um, so indeed, it's pretty, except for the equivariant term, but there, since it only involves the tangent vector field, I assume that's not too horrible either. You can conclude that whatever it is, it only involves the curvature. So, you know, you can try and do some abstract discussion to work out what terms could appear, get guilty on your side. It's getting a bit old now, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, even you, 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 your computer is a square of the width operator, it's messed up. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't see any guarantee that it's good. But on the other hand, the thing is pretty simple. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know. So, I don't know. But there, unfortunately, is a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Let's thank uh, Richard for a wonderful talk and uh, for... And My in, apologies in, for the technical difficulties and incompetence. No, but it was, you know, you explained it well, so.